Well, this is like my third attempt, third different title. Idaho 4, a view of Dylan and Bethany. I'm going to recap and try to keep it as simple as possible and as short as possible. Data that we, we can confirm, it is fact. And I'm going to run through the scenario with those facts as to what we are told to believe happened that night. We're told that somebody entered that home with a K-bar knife in a sheath. A sheet that was not attached to them, even though it's designed to be physically attached to your belt. Okay. And that person went upstairs, to, went up a flight of stairs and committed a horrific act of murder against two young women. And the commission of this crime, this person's knife sheath that obviously wasn't attached to them in it at all, ended up on the bed, partially under the bedspread and the, the victim, Maddie. Um, face down on the bed, viewable from the doorway, according to what the police have told us. Let's just examine that quickly, folks. Let, let's pre let's pretend, um, you know, let's not even pretend that. Let, let's just say that somebody with the intent to go cause bodily injury or murder is going to go into a home with arguably a devastating weapon called a K-bar. A K-bar that is typically sharp enough and pointy enough that you would keep it in its sheath to protect yourself from it. A sheath that's designed to be firmly attached to the person uh, to give you not just easy access, but a safe way to move the blade around to keep your hands free. Yet we're made to understand that a person with this kind of a weapon walked into the home with it in their hand, which is no less akin to a man with a gun with the bullets in his pocket entering that property. He entered a home to commit homicide with a weapon that was not prepared for the, for the work at hand as they entered that home and went up that staircase. Now, if it were unsheathed, that would require the person that was going to commit this crime to have both hands engaged, moving the sheath and knife through that home and ultimately left that sheath in the room where Maddie and Bethany were. Is that possible? Sure. But how well does it really fit that data set? How well does it really fit that data set? Let me propose an alternative to what you're saying. Let me go back to the beginning where they told us this was a crime of passion. And then they stuttered and fumble fucked themselves into telling you something else. A crime of passion, based on the circumstances that they observed once they came upon the crime scene itself. We all agreed that that made sense. And I think if we are, we're willing to look at that, we're going to look at a crime of passion. And the story that I'm about to tell you uh, is fiction. I, I don't know it to be accurate, any more accurate than the story they told you about Brian. A story that we now know is virtually being destroyed by their own admissions. No stalking, no photo of his car, but someone else's car. They've admitted that. Uh, no phone pings place him at the house. And uh, the locations that, that they're claiming exist on his driving after the crime, place him nowhere near the crime. On their own emissions. So let's throw that away and put it, let's package that up and put it in a little book and we'll put it on a shelf. Because that, that's what we're told that that's what happened and this is what we must believe. Even though that's pretty much been destroyed. So let's now look at the, the data in a different light. Let's take into things that we comfortably are aware of. We're comfortably aware of the fact that generally a crime like this is done from an inner circle or from the inner circle circle. So I'm friends with you and your circle, your friends may have ancillary connection or knowledge of me. So your circle isn't just your immediate friends. It's also your immediate friends, friends that become either directly or indirectly part of your circle. And, and typically, when you look at any kind of a crime like this, isn't it rather curious that more often than not, the person person, or persons that were there before, during, and after and reported it, isn't it more likely and more oftenly taking place that those people were involved? Now, let's be honest here. That's a fact. That's, it's not me making stuff up to, because I want to paint this picture. I have no, no horse in this race. I have None. I don't care if two people watch this. I, you click, you click me a million times. I ain't getting any money for it, folks. 
Don't need your money. Don't want your damn money. But I do want to help people try to analyze facts for what they are. To look at the data and only examine the data and see where the data fits itself in, right? Without coming out with some, some well, this could have happened. No, no, no. I don't know that Koberger did it. You don't know that Koberger did it. I don't know who did it. I don't know. You know, some people are out there claiming fraternities and they're, they're putting all of these crazy, well, look at this and look at that. There was one story that 400 people witnessed this happen on cell phones. Why? Because the, 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 the defense said they had 400 witnesses to, to interview. And they immediately jumped that this was being broadcast live on the phone. And everybody, 400 people witnessed these murders. I'm not going to give you a story like that, folks. You can't verify that. There's nothing to prove that. And then it was finally confirmed, in fact, that the 400 witnesses were for a jury survey. A jury survey that confirmed Brian Koberger's 12 previous trips to that area did not include stalking any of the victims. Okay? That's what we learned from that jury survey. So back to the situation in the house. Let's run the situation in the house under a different pretext. Let's consider that the people that are in the house are involved in the crime. I think that that's justified. I don't say that this, this in no way, shape, or form, um, just some guy. It's just, it's just my opinion. It does, you know what I mean? My thoughts on this, my, my assemblage of the information, which in no way, shape, or form can be used to hurt or harm anybody. This is just what I see the story of the facts telling me. So let's let's let these facts tell a story. I'll share the story that the facts have told me. Taking what I've already said about the knife, let's step forward into this particular idea. Nobody entered that home with the intent to kill. And what happened on the third floor of that home, there was never any intent to kill whatsoever by any of the uh, the, the two uh, the two young women there or the third party that entered that room. Uh, and that's unequivocal. A third party entered that room. There's no doubt about that. At that point, something took place and these two young women lost their lives. One of them fighting back ferociously that then took many, many more wounds than, than and, and I think this is what contributed to the idea of a, of a crime of passion. So, so let me lay this particular scenario out for you. And this is not, I am not saying that this happened. Nor am I saying, and I'm going to bring Dylan into this. I am not saying Dylan did anything wrong that night. I'm only giving you a story based on facts, a story that can be made based on real data. If we're to assume, right, or we're to go and, and uh, fuck the assume, let's just take the fact. The fact is it was a crime of passion. Who could that have been? Could have been one of the girl's boyfriends or girlfriends. It could have been the boy that they were texting that night. That's been ruled out. He had an alibi. So where else could a crime of passion have occurred? And what we know, the only indication we have of any kind of a relationship that could include passion would be between the three girls and Bethany being the center of the passion between Dylan and Maddie. Dylan, who invited her back based on data we've been given to be her number one. Bethany, who accepted um, to come back because she wanted to show her friends her new Range Rover. And, and she came and she was Dylan's first or something, or Dylan's number one at a college event. Listen, I, I didn't go to college, so I, I just wanted to say, I don't even know what that is. If you're going to invite someone to be your first or your whatever the hell, it, I don't I don't know what that is. I don't really care to know what it is. All I know is that's the facts that have been presented to us. So Bethany's presence in that house which she had already moved out of, was unique. And the knowledge of her presence in that house would have been unique as well, okay? Um, and, and as much as people knew she was, the people in that house all knew she was going to be there, right? And they all knew that she was there that night after the events because this murder took place after the events of the uh, being my first or my number one. So the people in that house definitively knew her presence because. It seems to me that the fact can suggest that Dylan went up into that room and was jealous and an argument ensued. And that knife that was part of this crime was, was presented by, uh, by one of the victims as a means to tell Dylan, get the F away from me, stay back, I'm going to defend myself. And it appears that that knife was taken from, from, from the girl that pulled that knife. 
I say this for a couple of reasons. This scenario does fit when you look at where the knife sheath was located. The knife sheath was on the bed, under the comforter, under the thigh or hip or something of, of Maddie, right? Which would place the knife sheath in the left hand of whoever placed it there. Now, being that most people, and I'm, I'm pretty sure both of those young women were right-handed, is it possible Maddie hit, Maddie did this? Sure, Maddie could have put the sheet there as well and held the, hand, the knife in her left hand. That may be how the knife was taken. That may be how the crime started. It was a crime of passion. It was a crime of anger and jealousy. And it erupted. And the knife, once it was introduced into this, this, this argument, became the weapon that was used to take the lives of these two young women with not the intent of murder. Just raw, raw rage and, and passion and jealousy and anger and being threatened with that knife, and it just went out of control. I think I think the facts can support that. I think the fact that the police had told us that that knife sheath was visible from the doorway, that it was face down on the bed, um, it makes it seem as if that knife, well, it doesn't even make it seem. It, it, that knife, you can, you can almost say that sheath was placed there, which I think the defense attorney did. And then everybody jumped for that. And, and let me be clear, I'm not accusing the police of anything here. I'm not saying they put it there, not even close. I'm saying that that knife was part of that room. It was in the possession of one of the victims and it was placed there by one of the victims. And that knife was sadly turned upon the victims. And that's how they became the victims that they are. And the person that did that, it's likely it could have been either Dylan or Bethany. I focus more towards Dylan and I'll, you'll see why as I move forward with just facts. How do you explain the murders in the front of the house? Well, we know that as of 4.12 a.m., uh, Zaina had made a TikTok post or was part of, was doing something on TikTok. So we can be confident that from, from somewhere between 4.12 a.m. forward, Zaina and, and Ethan lost their lives. I suspect, based on the data that we have, that they were not targets. That they inadvertently, and I think it was Zena, inadvertently came across Dylan after Dylan committed the crime. For whatever reason this may be, it couldn't have been the door dash because that came in around four. But could it have been because of the noises that she was hearing? Could she have come out of her room? And, and again, I'm using could, but surrounding an absolute fact. We know they're deceased. We know the two girls upstairs were deceased while she was down on her phone using TikTok, they were being deceased at least, right? So what, how how the interaction between Dylan and Zayna played out, I highly suspect that whatever that was, whatever initiated that contact, was of no motive to to make contact. That it was a, it was just a bad luck, bad situation, bad luck, and you ended up with another brawl in the front room. Dylan with the knife then assaulting and taking the lives of the two the two people in the front room um, as, as they would have it's just out of fright out of being scared right i mean there's there's two young women upstairs that she just deceased and now somehow whatever the means came in contact with zena i specifically say zena because zena unlike ethan was not located on the bed Right or no? We know he wasn't. I'm sorry. He was located by the door the next the next morning, but she was located deeper in the room towards that exterior wall. So some battle must have taken place. Some kind of fight ensued, and and these two people were then ultimately their lives were taken. Now I'm going to get into more details surrounding Dylan and why I tend to look at her as uh, as part of the story. Not not that she did it. Not that she did it this way. Not that she had anything to do with it. Okay. But if you're going to look at the facts and try to fit a player into those facts, that's what I'm doing here, okay? And let's just say an innocent player. So, fine, we'll go with that. A completely innocent player. So let's now move forward. Let's go back to what we are now told to believe. We're made to believe that these four victims in two different rooms on two diametrically opposed parts of the home, in a pair, each in a pair, were... were their lives were taken by a K-Burn knife. The person that committed this crime left Zena's room, had to walk up a hallway and get around a staircase that has a waist-high wall on it. 
so the hallway is is you know hallway you always picture as being closed on all all two sides of the ceiling of the floor right all it's, it's a there's you can't see anything because you're in a hallway but this hallway the main walls after you got past the bathroom dropped down to a half wall so you could literally see across over into dylan's room from that point the staircase that let that you were walking around leads to the first floor where bethany stays we're, we're to understand that this person left this room, rounded that staircase, crossed the main living area, and then Dylan states that she witnessed this person, clad in black, wearing a mask with bushy eyebrows, approximately five foot ten. This is what we were told by Dylan herself. In this particular statement, there's a lot of problems with this statement, folks. There's a lot of reasons to be suspicious about this statement. And and here here it is when you consider the environment. <clears throat> and I'll start with the, with the beginning. So a person comes into the home from the sliding glass door, approaches through the kitchen, and the first thing they come in contact with, or the first visual cue of anything, is her door, not stairs, not a living room, coming from the sliding glass door and heading towards the hallway. The only thing you would really have in your vision for the first few steps is that door. Be straight in front of you. That person then went up the stairs, committed a crime, came down the stairs, went past that door again, committed a crime. And then when they were leaving, that door was open and there was a five foot, 10 inch tall, athletically built blonde looking out that made the identification of this individual that she claims was in that house. This is where her description of the events are suspect. The statement that he wore a mask is 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 telling. That means she saw the person face on. The face had bushy eyebrows. The person was clad in black. An observation you could make from any angle. But the only way you could observe a mask and bushy eyebrows is from a face on encounter. And and the face on encounter would have to have come from the common area as he walked. He was walking towards me. Walking towards you would have to come from the common area. And the common area is roughly five or six inches higher than the bedroom and kitchen floors. In other words, in order to go from the kitchen or the hallway to the common area, you must go up a step. That step will add five inches to your height. So in her statement where this person was five foot ten or taller, walking towards her, clad in black, Okay, and, and all the other, the, the, the bushy eyebrows, the mask. The question you have to ask is that once he stepped down from that particular step and made his way out towards the sliding glass door, as she indicated she witnessed, how is it the person went from being five foot ten or taller not to five foot five or taller? Once he stepped on the common floor that she was on, he would have been shorter than her, noticeably so, and that would have stuck with her. If he were really five foot ten of equal height to her, okay, then then when she noticed him, again, it places her looking out of the door. It would place her in such close proximity to this, this person that literally you wouldn't even have to extend your arm fully out to come in contact with one another. The hallway is one stride. You step from the step down and your next step puts you into the kitchen or right almost exactly into the kitchen. You're right there. You're right in front of Bethany's door, or not Bethany, Dylan's door. So this area is so confined and so small, the areas are separated by five or six inches of height that there would have been more for you to observe or maybe more accuracy could have been given in your description. Because once this person that was five foot 10 or taller as observed as they walked towards you would have shrank marginally when they started heading towards the kitchen because they would have had to step down. So her statement is all over the fucking place. And it doesn't comport when you try to parse it through on human nature, on human condition. When, when you're asked a question, okay, if I walk out into a parking lot and I say, hey, is, is that your car? You're going to give me the truth. What, what a lot of people don't realize is what makes lying so hard is you're naturally inclined to give the truth. Now, unless you're a sociopath. But most people, folks, just, is that your car? No. No, it's not my car. Why? And then, then it, you know, so here, here, let, let's follow her description. Five foot ten athletic build describes her. And then suddenly, which is what, what a lie requires, a lie requires a truth to hide. 
I want somebody to go ahead and disprove me there. You're hiding the truth when you tell a lie. Five foot ten athletic build, clad in black, wearing a mask with bushy eyebrows, is a description of one needle somewhere on the globe and or moon. Now go find it. You see, her statement to me of the description of this person is not only convoluted and, and a bit nonsensical, but it makes more sense when you realize what it takes to lie. And when you describe yourself at five foot ten or taller, that would be the or five foot ten and athletic build, that would be her own description. And then you jump into the abnormal uh clad in black and blah, 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 blah. That that then is is covering for your initial truth. That's how I I, I interpret that. Now, could, could I be wildly wrong? Absolutely, but it's just an interpretation of the data, right? I have no evidence to support this stuff, nor do they have any evidence apparently to support their accusations against Coburger. What's good for the goose, good for the gander, folks. Okay. So we have all of those issues with her description. Let's go further into the things that she told us because she told us more and they don't make sense. She looked out of her room three times. Now, let me just say, that puts her awake during the crime. In the house, awake during the crime. Not, but she's not involved. Okay, okay. During her three times of opening the door, she claims that they were for reasons that, you know, let me just say, folks, let me just say that some of the things that she claims she witnessed and heard are things to me that proximity should be considered, especially when it comes down to a whimper. If you could hear a whimper, I suspect you're pretty close to it. I don't suspect you're across, the, you know, you're in the middle of the home and the whimper came from the front or the upstairs where the two, where the two crimes were committed. And if you were, can be susceptible enough to hear a whimper, you don't even have to have somebody scream to hear the kind of struggle that must have took place during the assault and the, and the murder of these four people. There's, you wouldn't have to hear a voice. The struggle itself would be obvious if you're capable of hearing a whimper. All right. These things, folks, are facts that I'm interpreting based on what seems to be very sensible here. How can you have this kind of activity within your home, right? And you can't hear anything unusual there, but you hear a whimper. Now, now let, let me go on further. Do you hope you see where this is going when it comes to the frozen shot face? How is it that you could witness this person that doesn't see you face on, but you see them face on, standing in the doorway, and you're a very tall, long-haired, blonde girl at night, probably wearing whatever, right? And that person that just committed these four horrific homicides doesn't observe you and doesn't take any action against you? No, no, quite the contrary. That person walks out towards the sliding glass door like he's like he owns the fucking place. And you, what do you do? Well, you tell us you go in the frozen shock phase. And you close and lock your door. A reaction of flight or fright is your claim. That's what took place. And yet, after this witnessing, after this fear that, took, that, that froze you, you didn't call for help, whether it be the authorities or anyone from outside of that property to come help you. As a matter of fact, that activity of calling for help or anybody outside of that property, including the authorities, didn't happen for eight hours after the crimes commission. That's rather suspicious. That's rather suspect. How can you take that data set that we that we all know exists? How can you take that data set and not ask yourself, is it possible the girls or one of the girls had any involvement in what happened here, either directly or indirectly through knowledge? How is it you heard somebody say, it's okay, I'm here to help? How is it that you heard somebody whimper? I don't object to the dog bark. And that, that I, anybody, I, I can't stand dogs that bark. But I, so I can hear that. That to me, that's fine. That, that I'll accept. You didn't have to be in proximity for the dog for you to hear that, right? So fair enough. But when it comes to the statement, it's okay, I'm here to help and a whimper. I think proximity is important in trying to understand how that could be heard, but not the struggles that went sued within that home. Struggles, let's be clear. Struggles for your life. Of four adults. These aren't children. These are adults. Your life, you're struggling. And nobody heard that? Dylan didn't hear that? And he didn't hear that? 
highly suspect, folks. Now, I'm going to end this, and I'm going to say that I in no way, shape, or form have any understanding or any knowledge or anything that would imply that, that this is what happened in that house. I, I only am taking the information they gave me, and I'm looking at the available people that could be involved here. I'm not looking for drug cartels. I'm not accusing people of watching, 400 people watching this murder happen on their cell phone. I'm not talking about reflections and asphalt. I'm not creating information and assembling it. I'm not creating fake bullshit to make the story that I just told you fit. The story that I told you fit because it fits. It doesn't mean it's real. It doesn't mean it happened that way. But it's rather freaking curious that all that data can fit in there. And the explanations and the questions that, that should be applied to the data that we were given were never asked. This was never allowed to be talked about openly on the internet. People were shamed and shut down or booted or kicked or blocked in streams. I, I, I went through all of that. This, this particular analysis of the facts I've had since 2023, early 2023. And after everything died down in July of 23, I was going to, I had me, myself, and several other people that had channels were going to start to address this issue. And what happened? Boom, the Linda Lane footage show, showed up. And this particular bit of information I'm sharing with you now, I didn't have a stream and I didn't want to be a streamer. And so the assemblage of these, these pieces of data, uh, although I had them and I've, I've had them for ever since I, I reviewed the data, uh, were silenced by many of you people that think you have some moral moral superiority to others you have a horrific homicide everybody and everything deserves to be questioned but everything and everything shouldn't be questioned in a way to impugn and accuse if the facts make that statement fine that still doesn't mean the facts are accurate but if you can assemble this information as i have in a timeline in a data set based only on the fact then it should be considered that's it to not do that they have to talk about the Banfield. They have to talk about the Frats. They have to talk about the Grub Truck. None of that shit is anywhere in any way, shape, or form connected to this crime in any of the legal documents, arguments, or proceedings, in any of the accusatory documents. None of that stuff has any connection to this crime scene, except in your own head. Now, does that mean your analysis couldn't be true? No. No, but your analysis doesn't have any solid footing on fact. None. Yeah, they were at the grub truck. So does that mean the grub truck had something to do with their murders? No. Or anybody around the grub truck? They looked suspicious. They looked this. No. You can't connect any of the people you're suggesting are involved to the house, to the time, to the crime. But you can connect Dylan and Bethany, can't you? You see? Before, during, after, and part of the contact. Bethany is said to have been out front. Dylan in the home. Listen. Think on this, folks. Don't go around accusing Dylan of doing anything. That's not why I made this. The primary purpose for making this was to show you that when you stay in the lines, when you color within the lines of the data that you have, there is information that you can derive from that. Not meaning that that information is written in stone like the Ten Commandments, but meaning that that information, because it does correlate and connect dots, should have always been considered, should have been looked at. And now here we are, all these 18 months later, and the case around Kohlberger appears to be crumbling. And now people are wondering, what happened? What happened? The house is gone. The main house is gone from this. The, the major piece of where the crimes took place completely erased. I suspect that there, there, there can be more investigation, should be more investigation. If they have other evidence that shows Kohlberger did it, then fantastic. Then, then lock the guy up and, and do what you got to do according to your laws. But at this stage of the game, folks, uh, I mean, I, I, fairly enough, I mean, I'm, I'm posting this pretty late in the game. There's no question about it. Um, but it's nothing that I've never said before. These facts I've arranged in the order that's consistent with the way they were delivered to us. These statements that were made by the people that remained in the property, Dylan, accordingly, are exactly the statements. I didn't add anything to them. I didn't say, well, if she saw this, I didn't do any of that, folks. I took her own words and pointed out to you that those own words don't really conform or fit the story that they're portrayed to fit. And the reason they don't is because of many, many things in the story that don't make damn sense. And the fact that the person they're claiming did it, um, there's more evidence now to show that he didn't than there was ever to show that he did. And the evidence that's being disputed, just so, and I want, this is, I'm going to end with this. 
The court and the defense attorney, or I'm sorry, the court and the prosecution attorney have confirmed multiple times that in the issue of the arrest warrant and subsequent warrants against Brian Koberger in the immediate aftermath of them deciding he was the perpetrator, not any of the IgG or any DNA was used to obtain these warrants. The only information that was used to obtain these warrants resides inside the PCA, which at this point has been completely debunked. So what will that leave us with? Right? Being debunked and you still have the ultimate horrific event that took place that night. How are any of the facts that are pertinent here? How are any of the things that we can actually put our hands around and read and discuss? How can they be applied to the, to the ultimate situation of four homicides in that house? And I suspect the police had it right in the beginning and didn't realize it when they said crime of passion. 